In this lecture, I'm going to look at the Faum Roman mummy portraits. Uh, these are exquisite works of art. Some of the finest portraiture of the ancient world and the last hurrah before, if you want to look at it that way, the Dark Ages descend on the Mediterranean and uh, we have to wait maybe a thousand years before we see something approaching it. And in some scholars who study the Roman mummy portraits um, compare the best of them to Rembrandt in terms of the, the artistry, the portrayal of emotion, the light, etc. So they are true works of art. In the 1880s, a number of beautiful and somewhat mysterious uh, portraits began to appear in Western Europe and America on the antiquities market. They were known to come from Egypt, um, and many of them came into the possession of an Austrian uh, art dealer, Theodore Graf. So he acquired a, quite a few of them. There was, uh, at that time, a, a a kind of suggestion, they're fake. You know, there's nothing has been found like this. They must be fake. Uh, but subsequently, excavations, particularly those by Flinders Petrie, William Matthew Flinders Petrie, um, found a large number of them in situ on mummies uh, so that they could be verified as legitimate and real. Uh, ancient objects. The date of them was uh, at this early point in research open to question. So people were, uh, took some time before they felt confident about the date. About a thousand of them are known today. So Flinders Petrie was working particularly at Hawara in the Faum oasis that we've been uh, talking about earlier on. So he excavated this cemetery and he found some hundreds of them in uh, this cemetery. Here and elsewhere in Roman Egypt, uh, the dead who were wealthy enough were wrapped in mummy cloths, quite often stupendously elaborate ones, uh, and provided with a painted portrait, often on wood, but sometimes on linen to cover their face. Um, these were products of the Greek naturalistic painting tradition. The best of them were painted clearly from life by master artists and craftsmen, uh, who knew how to paint. Um, the observer, one might say, has a direct communication with a dead person from 2,000 years ago, and they often have this most melancholy kind of aspect to them. You sort of have the sense that you're looking at uh, someone who has died, and despite that, they live on with a sense of, more, you know, a sense of... Uh, overcoming mortality, of overcoming the decay of their physical remains. So they're unique uh, representations of actual living people um, from a distant past, I have to say. The Fayum, they, they're usually known as Fayum portraits, but as we'll see, they came from other parts of Egypt as well are one of the most outstanding body of paintings to have survived from, certainly from antiquity. They're unique. So they would have been part of a broader tradition in the Greco-Roman world. So these kinds of portraits would certainly have been painted and used, as, as we'll describe, uh, in the broader part of the Roman Empire. So these are not unique objects to Egypt, but the unique thing about Egypt is the dry desert environment in which they ended up preserved them, whereas the ones that will have been created elsewhere don't survive. So that's the main reason why we have a thousand from, of these from Egypt. Egypt. 
The study of these uh, magnificent works of art has been somewhat neglected over the last century or so um, because if you're an Egyptologist like me, uh, these aren't Egyptian. So Egyptologists have tended not to study them. And if you're a classicist, they're in Egypt and they're not, you know, they're not... Um, they're not classical. Uh, so it's, it's, they're too early to be studied by, largely by Byzantine scholars. Uh, we're pre-Byzantine here, as we'll discover. So they're sort of fallen through the cracks in terms of academic research. It's quite interesting that people fall into their natural sphere and don't look outside it. It's quite interesting that that happens in scholarship. But they offer a unique uh, possibility to study all sorts of things. Uh, clothing, hairstyle, uh, jewelry, uh, life, uh, you know, aspects of life that we wouldn't naturally expect to get perhaps uh, just from the mummy itself. So the first mummy portraits from Egypt were acquired in 1615 when Pietro della Valle uh, visited Egypt and he bought two of them and they are now um, in Dresden. Subsequently, excavations by the British and French consuls in the early 19th century produced uh, more of these. Um, and the situation changed in the 1880s with systematic excavations of the Fayum Oasis. Okay, so a number of sites in the Fayum Oasis, uh, Rubaiyat and Hawara being Flinders Petrie's site, produced uh, examples of these um, objects. So they've been found, Hawara, also, Fag El Amus are the, are the two uh, important sites. And um, another uh, site is Rubaya in the Fayum. So, this Austrian businessman uh, acquired some of them and made a collection of them, Theodore Graf. So, they uh, were. Scholars were interested in them, uh, wanted to know where they came from, what they were. Excavations in the Fayum were vital for our understanding of these objects. The settlements in the Fayum oasis, like uh, this one, were on the edge of the agricultural zone in the desert, away from the inundation of the Nile. And this dry desert environment has um, enabled the preservation of these objects in a very fine state. Uh, a number of examples were found um, and are in the British Museum as a result of excavations. And Petrie excavated, as I said, in the 1880s and came back again in 1911 to undertake some further excavations and those uh, have ended up in the National Gallery. Um, although they're known as Fayum portraits, not all of them were found in the Fayum. So, uh, for instance, the French archaeologist Albert Gaillet uh, excavated at Antinoopolis in the middle part of Egypt and he found some. Other examples came from uh, Akmim area and down in Thebes as well. So you've got Antinoopolis and there's even some examples at a small port site on the Mediterranean have been found at Marina del El Alamein. Now, uh, there was a lot of debate in the earliest days. These objects uh, have been known uh, for a long time, and it was uncertain what date they were. 
people started to look at them. And obviously, when they were in a good archaeological context, it was possible to make some suggestions about the date of the mummy. If you find the mummy in association with perhaps an inscription, of which there are many, or um, with other artifacts, you can help to date these objects. It's subsequently been possible to refine the dating of these portraits by looking at things like uh, the style of hair and the style of jewellery can be used as a dating criteria for these portraits. And that's because uh, everything goes through fashion. And that was certainly true of Roman hairstyles and beard styles. So scholars who've been looking at these um, portraits have been looking and comparing them with uh, statues and other representations and archaeological finds, datable archaeological finds. And these days we can date these portraits to within 15 years perhaps of their date of creation by looking at things, all these things. Uh, so it's possible by looking at whether the person has a beard, we can say, with etc., that there was a fashion for beards coming in with Hadrian, etc. Um, and we can follow certainly the different hairstyles of men and women um, to have the conclusion that these objects begin in the time of the Roman emperor Tiberius, we're talking 20 to 30, if I go back, uh, 20 to 30 AD. They run through, um, through uh, the Hadrianic period, of which this is an example, from the earlier part of the second century AD. And they start to fade away in the late third century. So this is an example from the period of the Roman emperor Gallienus. 250s to 60s, and um, so scholars who are studying them, looking at style of representation, style of uh, hair, style of jewellery, uh, the use of uh, gilding as an attribute, all of these can help us to uh, form our conclusions on these dates. Um, so. At the end of all this, uh, these Roman mummy portraits, for they are Roman, were not present, cannot, none of them can be dated before Tiberius, and none of them really can be dated to the late 4th century AD. Uh, so Rome, as we've just been talking about, acquired Egypt in the time of Augustus, and within that period, shortly after, these portraits start to make their appearance on mummies in Egypt. And they disappear around the time that Christianity is taking hold in the Roman Empire. Uh, mummification and the processes uh, and the, the pagan rites associated with mummification made them less appealing. Uh, in fact, they went out of fashion. So Christianity seems to be responsible for their uh, demise. That's the usual interpretation. Now, I found quite a few of these cartonage uh, mummy masks when I was working on the Monash dig in uh, Takla Oasis. They're made of paper mache, painted, and they can be gilded. I found some gilded examples like this one. They are Ptolemaic in date. They are placed over the head of the mummy and are usually uh, painted with Egyptian religious iconography associated with um, mortuary cult. So you get representations of Osiris, obviously, Isis and Nephthys, and Anubis, of course, as in, as in this example. These seem to disappear with the arrival of the Romans, uh, and they're not present in Egypt in this period. So the Roman mummy portraits seem to be a product of the new administration, the new Roman culture, and they're 
a follow-on from, they don't seem to overlap much with the earlier kind of cartonage mask. They're a product of the classical world, in, one might say. Uh, a period of mixed uh, cultural attributes created the god Serapis. So Serapis is a kind of composite of Cyrus and Hades. So there were many religious traditions that were, were being uh, brought together here. And the, um, these Roman portraits seem to be the product of a newfound interest in representation of the dead and the creation of an image which will ensure eternal uh, preservation of the individual. Um, so Pliny, in his Natural History, a very famous work, in book 36 of his work, uh, talks in detail about the Roman custom of producing uh, ancestor cult representations of the dead which were kept in the cupboard. Um, you often had a wax image of Auntie Flo and you kept it in the cupboard and you could take that wax image of your deceased relative out and it could be, uh, it could participate in feasts and it could be involved in processions for part of the funeral of the dead person and commemorations of the funeral. Uh, these are modern renderings of what we think Roman wax portraits of the dead from the Republican period look like. Um, we believe that these mummy portraits are an outgrowth from an Egyptian perspective of this habit of keeping a representation of the dead in the house uh, to remember them and for it to be, uh, as we'll see, subsequently incorporated into the mummy. Uh, and a very odd custom seems to have taken hold amongst some people in Egypt um, of keeping the mummy in the house for some significant amount of time before it's buried. A very odd custom. The Fayum portraits are painted on either linen or wood. Uh, the examples that have been found obviously have been found in tombs on the bodies of the dead. The paintings uh, were inserted amongst the mummy wrappings and they seem to have totally replaced the three-dimensional cartonage masks of the first century BC. Uh, this is an example of, this is an actual example of uh, a mummy portrait on linen of a woman called Aline, the daughter of Herodas. So uh, on the mummy we have her identity is represented, is indicated. Um, we have this inscription associated with the burial. Aline, also called Tenos, daughter of Herodas, a kindly one, farewell, she was 35. And this is not an uncommon practice amongst the Romans on commemorative inscriptions to record how long a person lived. There are many Roman funeral texts that say he lived 35 years, two months and three days. So people were keeping tabs on how long they lived and they commemorated them. Um, so this is on linen, and we'll have a question about that in a moment. Uh, just think about it. Uh, the question is, was this painting made on linen long before she died and incorporated into the mummy wrappings? Was it made when she died? Uh, and painted at that point onto the 
onto the linen and incorporated? So these are uh, questions that we'll examine because this is an interesting issue with some of these. So that's another example on linen. Now, certainly you would, if you were painting these things in, in life and you were keeping them for some time to be incorporated in the mummy, to paint them on wooden boards would be more logical. You're going to keep them and, and they're going to be safer and better kept. The painting on linen suggests a, a much more fragile uh, kind of thing. Okay, so that's more likely to suffer from damage before being incorporated into the, the mummy. There's an example of a, a very simple portrait that's still incorporated into the mummy wrappings, um, again on uh, linen. The majority of the Fayon portraits are done on wood, and there are different sorts of woods that were used. And uh, while we're looking at this image, we'll see a couple of interesting things about this particular image. Uh, the timber is very thin. It's cut around or less than two millimeters thick. So it's um, very fine. But you'll notice that the paint doesn't go all the way to the edge. There's an unpainted section of the background. And at the bottom, too, it seems to come to an end. The other thing that is a common element of these Roman mummy portraits is they are quite often roughly hacked at the top so that originally the object was probably rectangular, but at some point it was changed and hacked to be a different shape. Um, or in almost every case, the grain of the timber runs vertically. So it sometimes fractures vertically and you get the splintering of the object. Uh, a very common timber used for these portraits is sycamore fig, which was widely available in Egypt. But many others were of cypress pine, cedar, fir, or lime, lime wood. Cypress uh, was particularly favoured in the objects that Petrie found at Hawara, um, cypress pine, but there were also cedar, which is, would be a more valuable, uh, obviously, timber to, to use because it's imported. In many portraits, there's a layer of underpainting which shows as a, a wide band of colour, um, often in examples like this where the natural timber is exposed at the bottom of the top, and then you get what is often a green uh, base colour that was, a, was applied to the timber. This undercoat is usually uh, tempera, distemper, animal glue mixed with pigment. So it's a kind of um, wash, if you like, that goes onto the timber surface, usually green. Uh, then the colors of the flesh are added to make the, the portrait stand out against this green background. The Fayon portraits are in three different styles. They can be tempera, which is where the image of the individual is a group of pigments mixed with a water-soluble binding agent, which can be animal glue, egg white, uh, are the two most commonly used. So this is... Um, used. They can be used to apply the color delicately. They tend not to blend. The colors that you apply uh, uh, don't blend very well and they dry very quickly because the 
uh, pigment is cool. And by examining the paintings, we can see that they used very fine brushes, often with hatching and cross-hatching with a very fine um, hair to give, to give a three-dimensionality to it. A particularly preferred method of painting is encaustic, where the pigments are mixed with beeswax. And this method certainly was developed and used in classical times for large-scale paintings that we know were hung in public places in the Greek world. So, for instance, in the Athenian Agora, uh, the Stoa Poikili uh, was famously hung with colossal famous scenes of, of battle, etc. And they would have done, been done in encaustic in, in the Greek world. Uh, in keo in Greek means to burn and implies the application of heat. Um, and we know that there's a reference in Seneca that paints were, that this method of painting in, in hot wax, it uh, required great speed to be used in the painting process. You can't just fuff about um, because you have to keep the wax cold, uh, you have to keep the wax hot, uh, you have to be, you have to have a fire underneath it, and you need to rapidly uh, put the colour on uh, before it sets, because the wax will cool and set. Uh, so this pigment um, with beeswax is often applied with a, obviously with a spatula. You can't use a brush to put encaustic onto a wooden board. It's not possible. Can you imagine a thick wax, uh, colored wax? It's not possible. So it's almost Picasso, um, it's almost Van Gogh X, uh, thickly applied with a little spatula. The other method that's used amongst these portraits is so-called punic wax, which is a slightly different method. It's a cold uh, method of applying wax. And in this case, the wax is uh, mixed with egg and oil and can be applied um, usually in addition with gum arabic or mastic to give it um, some more fluidity. You have to uh, combine the wax to make it a kind of slush, a slurry that you can apply to the timber. Most of the Fayon portraits are encaustic. That means that the artist had to quickly add the colored wax um, to either the linen or the wood. Um, so Pliny, in his natural history, who gives a long history of painting in the ancient world, it's a very interesting book if you haven't read Pliny's natural history. He gives a history of painting, refers to those who paint in encaustic with the cortirium, the kestrum and the brush, the first two being uh, hard tools or spatulas. The best of the Fayon portraits, of which this is an example, uh, compared to the work of, of grand European masters, the, the exquisite works of art, and often have a kind of impressionistic character to them to create the sense of three-dimensionality. The artists are using only four colors to create their paintings, and that was common for all of antiquity, the classical period. White, yellow, red, and black are the principal colors. And the, the white is just crushed up chalk. The others are ochre, and black is from the soot of, burnt, of a burnt substance. Some elements of color were added uh, with, with minor use of additional colors, particularly green and blue, which is coming from uh, either minerals or from madder, uh, a, a dye. Uh, 
And these would are usually added by addition with egg whites to give them a different sort of consistency. Uh, we know from historical sources that there were large numbers of celebrated paintings from the ancient world which have not survived uh, of the tens of thousands of uh, ancient works of art from Greece. They don't survive. Uh, they were on wooden boards like these and were hung in public places or in the house. Um, but uh, these, uh, the small surviving examples of what was probably a broad tradition right through certainly the Greek world. There are a few examples of Greek painting that survive and they're usually from a funerary context the examples are just a few. This is from um, a royal tomb at, uh, in Macedonia showing the rape of Persephone by Hades. And it gives us an example of the sort of uh, subject, the sense of motion, the moving of um, clothing, moving of hair that the Greek artists were quite capable of producing, but we just don't have examples of it uh, from the Greek world. Uh, the best uh, parallels that we have for the film portraits are, of course, Roman frescoes from Pompeii, Herculaneum, and Stabiae, uh, of which these sort of things are examples. So uh, this representation of mythological subjects shows um, the ability of the ancient artist to render a subject very realistically with realistic clothing and uh, the face showing in all sorts of uh, foreshortening. So you get some profile face, uh, some full face, etc. And there are a number of famous uh, fresco portions that are in the Naples Museum, which are the best parallel for the Roman mummy portraits from Egypt, uh, including this famous example of a lady reading and writing. And Terentius Neo and his wife, uh, and another fresco from Pompeii, provide an example of uh, the kind of work that would have been more accessible, certainly owned and created in the broader Roman world. And the other kind of ways we can assess the, the basis on which these artists were working, the, the kind of things they were doing, is when we have famous fresco renderings of paintings. This is the famous Alexander Mosaic from the Villa of the Fawn from Pompeii, and it's a, fr a mosaic version of a painting. The painting doesn't survive, but the mosaic does to give us an impression of what ancient painters were doing. They were producing all sorts of portraits of this kind of uh, thing. Now, I just put in a little bit of text from Pliny the Elder, Natural History, and he um, talks about one of the most famous artists, Apelles, um, who was a contemporary of Alexander the Great and who came to work in Egypt in the period of Ptolemy I. And we know uh, from Pliny's descriptions the sort of work that he was doing and, this, and the fact that uh, coming to Egypt, he established the so-called Alexandrian School of Art and began to teach art to, the, uh, to an Egyptian um, core of artisans and craftsmen. And so the origins of the Roman portraits are probably going back to Apelles's art school in Alexandria, the school of Alexandria, it was called. And we have many um, textual sources about these artists and what they were producing. <clears throat> 
One of the most interesting representations of an ancient artist from the Roman period, and this is a representation rather oddly put on the side of a sarcophagus, is this one from the Hermitage, which dates to about 100 AD, and it shows an artist um, painting, and he's using a fire. So he seems to be painting in encaustic. He's He's um, melting the wax and mixing the colors that he wants in the, in the object there. In front of him, he's got a grid pattern with, uh, with a sketch that he's going to transfer onto the painting. And he's painting. And he has examples of art in wooden frames, uh, which tells us, and we know from other inscriptional evidence, that people had portraits painted, mounted them in wooden frames, and put them on the wall for a variety of um, reasons. Uh, one of the interesting finds that Petrie found at Hawara was an actual uh, mummy portrait in a wooden frame that still survives. It was sort of propped up against the mummy. So in this case, it seems that the portrait had been painted, had been mounted in a very uh, crude wooden frame, and it had cords around the back that you can see there to indicate that it hang, hung probably in the house. Uh, and this is... Um, this, was, this is probably what we're looking at, that these were portraits done in life and put in frames and mounted on the wall of the house as a, as a portrait of the individual. Petrie um, also found, or this is another example, of a kind of portrait that must have been uh, visible in someone's house. In the center is a portrait of an individual and two leaves of the triptych uh, open out to show Isis and Serapis on either side. So it's being kept quite clearly as a mortuary object. You have the image of the person in the center and you have uh, this is being used at home as a memorial of a dead person. Um, certainly seems to be the implication, and it ended up in someone's tomb. There are um, some very few surviving examples of portraiture outside a tomb context, and this is the most famous of them. It's in Berlin, and it's a representation of the Roman Emperor Septimius Severus, his wife, Julia Domna, and the two children. Poor old Gita has been erased because he was subject to anathema. Uh, but these sort of representations of famous people were hung in public, often in frames, and in this case, the implication is that the person who painted this certainly did not have Septimius Severus in front of him. Um, you know saying, please hold while I get your nose just right. He was painting probably uh, duplicates of official portraiture which was distributed throughout the empire, and these kind of objects were being uh, hung up in public places. It's a kind of tondo around representation of the royal family. Uh, we know that the painters in Egypt were uh, were both foreign and native, as in they were, uh, there were native Egyptians, apparently, who were painting portraits um, from inscriptional evidence. Painters were known as zoographoi, which means those who paint life. They could also be called uh, encostia, those who paint hot, uh, if you like. The inscriptional evidence tends to indicate that they were itinerant artists who moved about in the Hellenistic world seeking new clients. So they would uh, come up to you and say, you want me to paint your portrait? Uh, and the answer was, yes, 
uh, okay? And we know from some textual sources that they could be paid in wine, which is an interesting um, a sort of exchange. I'll paint your portrait for three jars of wine. That sort of thing was relatively uh, common, apparently. What is the purpose of these paintings originally? Um, as we said, portraits of famous people like the emperors were hung up in public places. But it seems that people did commission portraits of themselves to be hung in the house. And the implication is that the portrait was cut down, taken out of its mount and cut down and incorporated into the mummy wrappings to be a eternal image of a youthful dead. Um, so they are, to some extent, they're showing uh, somebody, we believe, in the peak of their life, possibly before death, but there seem to be some examples of... Um, you know, how do you explain, there are certainly some linen portraits that are done on the mummy itself. So the mummy has been created and then the portrait is painted uh, on the mummy itself. So there's a few examples of that which are interesting. The physical appearance of the subject varies uh, considerably. Uh, it's quite clear that the artist is trying to render the individual in the best possible way, that they're painted from life. Very few of these portraits show an old person. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, life expectancy in the Roman Empire, we know, was generally in the 30s and 40s. Most gravestones and most of these uh, assigned portraits say person died 32 and that's because of all sorts of reasons the lack of antibiotics etc um, in the case of ladies uh, the hazards of childbirth and the, and the chance of bacterial infections and all that sort of thing there are a few more mature looking portraits which must have been done uh, perhaps of an individual, in this case, this is done on linen. So the person has been painted on their mummy, so it seems, uh, of a more mature person. And there are many portraits of children. So uh, we can't say for certain in this case, was this portrait done um, when the child was alive and expecting to live to be 50 or was it done when they'd recently died and they wanted a, a portrait of the individual? It's, there's a degree of uncertainty in some of these. Um, in uh, some of the examples, this example, the person represented... Uh, when the archaeologists came to study the physical remains, found a person who was 89. Uh, and he seems to be younger than 89. Uh, so maybe it was a portrait done in his prime, which was kept and taken out of its frame and inserted on his body uh, when he died. That seems to be uh, an explanation this is a very interesting example um, where the portrait uh, is on linen and it got incorporated into the mummy wrappings. It seems to show a young individual, but the mummy was significantly older. So it, this seems definitely to be a case where a linen portrait has been made decades and has been in the house and been uh, possibly on show and then incorporated to reflect somebody who's not this age anymore. So that's, uh, there are some interesting examples like this. Likewise, um, Hermione, the teacher, the grammaticus, 
Uh, she seems to be more lifelike. She's, she was 25 when she died, and uh, we imagine that this portrait was painted around the time that she died. Now, was it, bef long, was it before or at the time of death? We can't uh, be, be sure. An inscription on this uh, mummy referred to Demos, age 24, remember her forever. Uh, and she was buried with a young child, probably her child, so um, they possibly died together, possibly in childbirth or just through disease. So th this question of the age is, uh, is something that's of interest. With Obviously, ongoing research can perhaps suggest things. Um, there's certainly evidence to indicate that uh, the portraits were hung in the house and that gilding was subsequently added to the portrait uh, when it was incorporated into the mummy wrappings. So there was a much earlier rendering of the individual and then gilding and uh, a wreath were often added to make the face uh, almost like a religious icon from the Byzantine period. Uh, who are they? They're clearly uh, elite people who can afford to pay an artist, who want to pay an artist. Um, some, obviously, uh, the parents have commissioned a portrait of, of a child who has died. Um, a number of examples are show the individual as naked, and we might think, well, that's a little bit odd. But what they're trying to represent is their citizenship and cultural background. This is a young person who goes to the gymnasium, exercises naked, and competes in the stadium. So the nakedness is um, indicating culture. It's indicating Greekness, not certainly not e Egyptianness. Egyptians tended not to run around naked in stadiums. Um, but people of Greek cultural heritage certainly did. So that's why some of them are naked. They, they appear without clothes. Uh, lack of beard can and was used to indicate youth, and many of the mummies conform with the representation that the person was 19 when they died, and this seems to be a true portrait of the individual. Uh, beards start to appear in the second century uh, as a fashion statement, as we've seen, and can be used for dating um, criteria. They're particularly useful for that. Um, now, very briefly, I presume we're under a time constraint <laughs> to get out of. Uh, the clothing, jewellery, very uh, interesting. They certainly tell us something about the aspirations and the, and the status of the individuals and the changing um, fashion for clothing. All of these attributes uh, do. Um, what's interesting is that some of the, particularly, I mean, this is a, one of, this is considered one of the greatest examples of the Fail Mummy portrait for uh, the liveliness of the individual, the ability to represent the living person, their fashion and their clothing, for instance. We often see soldiers represented on mummy portraits. So these are, these, this red leather uh, is the sword belt that goes across your, um, across your chest. It's a common subject. Um, occasionally other elements of the representation give away their position and status. This is a priest of Serapis, uh, which is indicated by the star on his brow. And it's another really amazing um, example of this art. We know that this individual was very wealthy. She was wrapped in exquisite linen, but she has no jewellery whatsoever. So the, 
uh, the presence of jewelry doesn't necessarily indicate uh, wealth and status. It must be a personal choice uh, in some instances. Um, so Hermione, the, te the teacher, has been represented with quite elaborate and wealthy jewellery, as has this lady. Um, does it reflect what she actually wore? We don't know. Now, very briefly, I just want to talk about this example from the British Museum. Uh, he's a, a boy who died at the age of about 17. It's possible to interpret his age of death from his physical remains. Um, there's no inscription associated with him. That's quite common. And one of the strange and interesting things, which was also common in the Roman period, he wasn't mummified. He was simply wrapped in a very uh, elaborate bandaging and wrapping, and this portrait was placed over his face. Uh, so these Roman mummy portraits, um, certainly from the late 1st and 2nd century, are not often mummified, so the remains are poorly preserved inside. You have often a lot of decay. And the, uh, the mummifier is um, creating a work of art, an external work of art around the human remains, which are poorly preserved. Uh, Petrie noticed in many of these mummies when he found them that they were, could be quite beautiful, like this example from the British Museum, but they were damaged. There was a lot of damage around the feet, he often found, and around the head. And he suggested, uh, and there's some evidence to suggest this is the case, that the family got the mummy back from the mummifiers and kept it in the cupboard. Um, and they used it as a... Uh, representation of the deceased and would open the cupboard and have a lunch with the dead. And this could go on for quite a lot of time and that the mummy may probably have been brought out on special occasions and got scuffed. And um, so it became an object of art in which Auntie Flo is inside. Uh, it's part of the funeral cult of the Romans, this idea of bringing the dead uh, and, and having the dead around you. I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about Roman mummy portraits.